So with these, with these things that clip up, if you just draw them on where the vertical axis is, return on equity, you can see they're, they're zooming up, they're diverging, uh, and that, that's a problem to say the least. Now, you can remedy that too. You know, you can remedy the, R of the minimum rate on line by putting a floor. Well, you can remedy this by putting a cap on. And if you think about it, that piecewise linear sort of did that. You know, we went, we went from some point and then we did a straight shot to one one. We didn't go up and then, and then cap. We took, a, we took a diagonal. Now, well, let's look at that and, and see what that means. So, that straight line from the last blue dot, if you, if you think about this, you've got some similar triangles. The relationship between the expected profit and the investment is constant along that whole range there. And that means it's a constant ratio, and that means it's a constant return on equity. And lo and behold, you draw it, and the ROE scale, there you go. As soon as we get to that straight shot, we're trucking along at a 31% ROE for most of the range. Well, it's better than infinity, but uh, it is kind of strange that all of these, you know, ranging from about a 20% loss probability to all the way up to 100% should all be priced at the same ROE. So that's, that's probably not what you want to do either. So that leaves us these other curved ones. And, you know, eyeballing this, it's hard to say. So we'll go, we'll jump straight to the ROE per, uh, perspective. And, oh, okay, this is interesting. The, uh, the Wang transform, the dashed green, that cruises up and up and up and eventually diverges to infinity as you get close to one on uh, the loss scale, the expected loss probability scale. Uh, the Wang with the outside T distribution, uh-oh, we got a problem there. It reverses itself. And this is actually because uh, it turns out if you construct your Wang with a, uh, a normal on the inside and a T on the outside, it's technically it's not a it's not a, a, a proper distortion measure because eventually G of S becomes less than S. Oops. Um, again, my bad. I was the one that suggested this to Sean Wang. Uh, he's aware of the problem. Uh, you know, he knew it already. It was not news to him, but he's too polite to say anything about it. Uh, if you replace the, both of them, the inner one and the outer one, with a T distribution, you, know, you buy yourself another degree of freedom. Um, and, and, and I did that, I fit that to, to this data, but I didn't show it because what happens is that the best fitting version of that has infinite degrees of freedom. So it's really back to the regular way anyway. So it would just show the same thing as the regular way. Uh, the proportional hazards, the red dash one on the bottom there, that's, that's, that's you know, nothing to complain about there. We've got a nice gentle curve, it goes up pretty reasonably. And then the, uh, the yellow one, our linear yield model, that is a straight line. And that is not a coincidence. It was designed to be a straight line. And I'm going to spend a few minutes now, if I have a few minutes, yeah, I have one minute, I'll take more than one minute, to, uh, to talk about that. Uh, no, uh, no CAS talk is complete without a reference to Don Mango. So this is mine. Uh, I'm dipping into his insurance capital as a shared asset uh, paper, which had a lot of interesting things to say, one of which is that uh, capital is a shared asset, which is why you shouldn't be allocating capital. But that's another story. I want to focus on the other, other interesting thing he had to say is that there are two ways of using capital. One of them is uh, called the consumption use, and that is money gets used to pay claims. But there's another use, is that some money might not be used to pay claims. But it was still there. It still served a purpose. It was there potentially to be used. It was backing the risk. So we have two distinct uses, and, and he used the analogy of a hotel. A hotel room is occupied. There's a, an opportunity cost. You can't do something else with it. Um, it's still there at the end of the rental period. Uh, but you need to be reimbursed for that use. Uh, on the other hand, there's the possibility that it will get consumed, that it won't be there at the end of the period, in which case you have a, a probability that you'll need repair, business interruption, etc. Now, in insurance, you get the same thing. If capital is consumed, you need to replace it. You have loss of use while it's being replaced. You may even have some reputational hits. So there are other reasons why you need to be compensated for that. So, mathematically, those of us who like mathematical models, <laughs> we're going to say, all right, occupancy charge is simply going to be some rate applied to the investment. Now, we're talking about tranches now. So we have a tranche. Uh, we already know the probability of loss. 
Uh, we already know from our distortion function what the investor is willing to put in. We're calling that V here. Now the, the charge is going to be R sub O times V. This is going to be a, a pretty low number, something like the risk-free rate, but maybe not the risk-free rate. Maybe it's going to be greater than the risk-free rate uh, because of a number of reasons. Uh, there might be a liquidity issue going on. A, you, you might be borrowing this money, and in effect from shareholders, you are borrowing their money. Uh, then there's financial frictions, there's always taxation. You know, there might be tax issues. There's a, there's a whole host of reasons why it might be greater than the risk-free rate, but it's not going to be a huge number. On the other hand, the consumption charge, we want to make proportional to the expected loss. So V times S is the expected loss, and we're going to hit that with an R sub K, which is going to be a much larger number. Finally, we're going to say the expected profit, okay, the expected profit has GS minus S. We're going to say the expected profit needs to be the sum of these two charges. So if we put, pull all of that together and massage it algebraically, and the, and the handout does that for you, we come to the conclusion that the expected or demanded rate of return, the ROE on that tranche, is just R dot O plus R, dot, uh, R sub K times S. Uh, and so the yield that we're demanding is a linear function of the loss probability, a linear yield. So that's the linear yield model. Now, previously, we saw how we can take G of S and S and translate that into ROE. Well, we can go backwards, and that's what we're doing here. We're going backwards from the ROKS -R back to a G of S. Now, this is a more sophisticated version. It includes the time value of money. Uh, we haven't been talking about that, so just, you know, blot that out in your mind uh, and just think of it as, as one minus that ratio. If you plug in uh, S equals one, you'll see it's one minus one, so it does go to one one naturally. If you plug in S equals zero, you'll see it doesn't go to zero, but that's okay. We can have a jump to zero. So that's how you get your minimum rate on line out of this, which I'll get to in a minute. What do these look like? Uh, again, uh, like I did yesterday, compared to uh, the Wang transform, and um, I'm not going to spend any time on this picture, just get to the chase here, uh, where the Wang transform will shift everything on a normal distribution, the linear yield, uh, will create something that's a little bit skewed and a little narrower, whereas the proportional hazards, if you were here yesterday, really spread it out big time. So again, it's behaving a little differently. Uh, mentioned the minimum rate online, we can if you start with a minimum rate on line, you can back into what R sub O has to be. Uh, as to the capital cost, uh, Jesse's going to address that. <laughs> Consumption cost. 